All right, this is going to have absolutely full spoilers for the book Hyperion by Dan Simmons. There are going to be more videos about this. I've been talking about it with my friend Thrash on our Not A Podcast on Tuesdays. Uh, we're working on editing that and putting it out, the sort of longer form conversation about this book. So uh, I'll provide links. So I didn't read this book. I listened to it. And I haven't read a book, novel, fiction, or otherwise, in years. So Audible got me. Audible is a nasty Amazon company. Don't have anything to do with them. Uh, I saw a thing that said, listen to some free books for this promotion. I said, okay. And they were like, we're going to charge you in three months or whatever. And I said, well, I'm going to turn off the subscription. And I thought I did, and they charged me anyway. I, I do not care for Jeff Bezos. For me, a moment of quiet is rare these days, and it's my own fault. So how do you experience a book in a world that has Twitter and World of Warcraft and 24-7 Matrix noise being pumped into your skull? I find that there are certain types of games that I like to sit and listen to a podcast or a YouTube video or something. I don't want this whole video to start being about immersion or even about games, but all of the videos here are truly about my experience, so... But anyway, I like to play these sim games, like these industrial simulator job simulator games. Much like a click parade or an RPG, they are a turn-your-brain-off kind of game. The thing is, though, that a turn-your-brain-off kind of anything also kind of means that you might not really need your brain to do it, and your brain could maybe be listening to a book. And so that's something that I've been doing. So anyway, a priest, a scholar, a detective, a poet, a government agent, a soldier, and a Templar. Did I say them all? Ride through space on a giant tree. Their destination is the planet Hyperion. Uh, one of the nine labyrinthian worlds where they are all destined to die. So that's off-putting right from the start. Why, why do they all have to die? I don't really need to say this, but obviously I was high when I was listening to this. I might miss some details and get some points wrong, and uh, that's okay. The journey is the destination. The point is to interpret the work through the lens of your own nonsense. And I guess, and I talked about this in the longer form <clears throat> talk, but it's not really clear exactly how they ended up in this situation. They all have volunteered, they all want to go, they all have their reasons for going. But it's also mentioned that maybe they were all selected by a government agent or agency, and in fact that uh, gets confirmed, confirmed and elaborated on in the following book. It's a little bit of a fiddly bit, maybe just for me, because like just personally, if a character in a narrative is going to make the noble sacrifice of their own life, I'm just not going to buy it no matter what. I don't, that doesn't, that's, does, that's not something people do. I don't believe it. If I start, tar tar if I start talking about books in general more, I'm going to end up using this term a lot. I might just end up, but I mean this term, I might end up using this term really just to talk about this book so much because this book is dripping with it. It might get really annoying how much I start using the term world building, but this book has got a lot of world building going on. This book is just more than the plot. It is just dripping with lore and little tidbits and <laughs> world building and pieces, tiny little nuggets of information about the society, the politics, the interplanary hegemony, 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 and the biology of how the biology and technology of how all this works, especially technology. 
So speaking of world building, the world of Hyperion has got a creature living on it called the Shrike. Uh, there is a Shrike church. Members of the Shrike church go on a pilgrimage every once in a while, and that's what's going on in this story. Although it, it I feel like mostly these pilgrimages originate on Hyperion. Maybe not always, but these seven people are traveling from the world web, which is the... Those are the worlds connected in the hegemony of man. Uh, connected worlds you can travel to instantly. Outback worlds outside of the web. You have to fly on a tree or something. So seven people depart on a Shrike pilgrimage. It is said, I don't believe anyone has returned. It is said that the Shrike will immediately kill six of the pilgrims and grant the wishes of the seventh. But maybe it just kills them all. Or maybe it doesn't even exist. Maybe it's religious nonsense. It's strange that it specifically uses the word kill and specifically talks about how the Shrike only communicates through death because it also says that it hangs its victims on hooks of a metal tree and that they writhe forever as they travel backwards in time like some kind of open-air sarlacc pit. A scary monster that is generally located in an area of Hyperion called the Time Tombs where people make these pilgrimages to, but now the Shrike has begun to wander outside of its area and has been spotted slaying people all over Hyperion to the point Hyperion is a mess right now. People are burning down Shrike churches because the Shrike is, is rampaging and destroying towns. Um, but also the ousters, an enemy of humanity who are actually uh, you know, humans who left the hegemony long ago, so long ago that they have now changed and are something other than human. World building. The ousters are also making aims for Hyperion, so Hyperion is a political hotspot. So each of our seven pilgrims... And the first one is the least amount of... We'll get to them. The first one is the least amount of, like, time travel -y stuff involved. All of the other stories involve some kind of time mistake or dilation or time... I don't want to say time travel, but time not behaving correctly. There's some time disparity in, all, in most of the stories, and a tiny bit in the first one. Lennar Hoyt wants to find Paul DeRay. Paul DeRay was lost among a colony of mysterious people that live out beyond the Tesla trees near a great crag in the earth. Paul DeRay, years earlier, uh, met Father Hoyt before traveling to Hyperion. And uh, he may have been going there on some kind of missionary context, but uh, he and one traveling companion had some trouble making it through the Tesla forest, where the Tesla trees zap people with lightning who get too close. And there they are attacked by some small statured people wrapped in cloaks wielding knives. They immediately murder uh, Duray's traveling companion. But when they see Duray's crucifix, they stop. There is, they don't speak very well. They're, they're, and uh, they use some... He actually uses a translator, but he can pick out some of the words they use. Uh, but they don't speak clearly. They speak very vaguely, and he's not always sure what they're talking about. They they speak vaguely, threateningly. You know, they tell him that you know if he do, if he breaks their rule, you know they're keeping him alive. They're not letting him leave. If he breaks their rules, one of them says something like, "We will stab you and bash your head with rocks until you sleep forever." You know, something like that. And. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the cruciform. He talks about how he follows the cruciform, or how they talk about how they are of the cruciform. They're, they have a very strict revulsion to nudity, by the way. Just, by the way, they don't ever want anyone to see them naked. Uh, Father DeRay, they say, is not of the cruciform, even though he may follow it. And every day they go down and they crawl, they climb down the cleft into a place of worship, and Father DeRay is not allowed because he is not of the cruciform, and he wants to know, so of course, curiosity gets the better of him, and one day when the Bakora are off gathering roots or whatever, by the way, they are also, they do not refer to themselves as Bakora. I think that is a local Hyperion word. There are 
cities and people on Hyperion, but it is largely wilderness. The Bakora refer to themselves as the three score and ten. There are 70 of them. They talk about how there are always three score and ten. They are the three score and ten. Uh, Father DeRay realizes that there are no elderly and no young among them. So eventually, when they're out hunting, he goes down the cleft and he finds a huge open cavern that contains a basilica. Uh, it is a large, it is an enormous room. Uh, I'm not sure if the entire room is like inlaid with jewels and ornamentation, but there is an altar and there is a cross covered in jewels that is clearly man-made by his estimate thousands of years old, older even than old earth. And it is important that Hyperion is one of these nine labyrinthian worlds because it is believed that if there was a race in the universe older than man, they had something to do with building these nine labyrinths. We've, we've, we've discovered nine labyrinthian worlds in the galaxy. And Hyperion is one of them. So Hyperion has been visited before. We don't really know who by, by who. So Paul DeRay thinks he has discovered proof that at least the cross, if not Christ, has been with humanity for a, a, for a long, for before humanity. This is something that perhaps is part of the plan of the universe itself. Here is thousands of years ago, before man left Earth, some other men were also worshiping this cross. <laughs> A great revelation, a great discovery. By the way, Paul DeRay is from the planet of Catholics. There's a whole Catholic planet. There's the whole tree, church, Templar planet. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different religious factions that are very world building. I feel like I'm going to end up. You know what? More. I feel like more happens in the first chapter. The rest of them are the rest of them are almost all little tales of personal horror. A lot of them are more, the rest of them are more character driven. This one is clearly driven by a plot line. Uh, when the Bakora find out that he has seen the Basilica, some of them want to kill him. They're all upset. There's a big debate. Some of them decide that he must become of the Cruciform. So they take him down to the Basilica through the secret passage, down another layer to the other Basilica which is also an entrance to the labyrinth, which I believe, which in so far I'm in the second book. No one has ever talked about even entering any of these labyrinths. I think that the entrances are not really known of. So here's one of them. And the Shrike is there and it seems to be just a bystander. It seems to be watching this happen. It has some connection to all of this, but it's kind of just watching this happen to Paul DeRay. And also in this cavern, clinging to the walls, are cross-shaped worms, glowing pink worm-like parasitic entities covered with little grabbing tendrils. And the Bakora forcibly pull one from the walls and apply it to Paul DeRay's chest. And I don't know if they all, you know, do a big reveal of lifting up their robes. They have a very no nudity, you know, thing going on. But anyway, at some point there's a, he figures out that the reason they are all never nude is because they all have one of these things stuck to their bodies. And when one of the three score and 10 die, the cruciform parasite has absorbed their DNA and it's able to reform that the say or a being, a similar being. Although they, these, uh, these Bakora were members of a colony ship that crashed and apparently encountered these these parasites. Um, and that was a long time ago. And like I said, there isn't a lot of time manipulation in the first story, but there's a lot about time debts and how uh, traveling outside of the web, you gotta go through hyperspace and traveling at the speed of light and also maybe you're in a suspended animation. You end up missing the lives of everyone you love because you spent 70 years taking one trip to, it gets more into it later on, blah, blah, blah. So this colony was lost and has been lost on Hyperion for who knows when. It was, it was very early on. Time debts have been incurred. We don't really know how long they've been here. But for generations, they've lived and died and been resurrected and come back a little bit lesser. And now they are these soft-faced, uh, cloak-wearing, you know, can, can 
not really communicate, very st- stab anyone that is not of the cruciform. Uh, so it's very painful for anyone of the cruciform to leave the area. Uh, he definitely can't go out near where the Tesla trees are. The cruciform, anytime he, it does, he does something, it does not like it jabs him with pain. Uh, if he tries to remove it or anything, it, it's very painful to him. Uh, Father Hoyt eventually comes in search of him, and he also finds the Bakora, and his traveling companions are also murdered. And one of them is so upset about this that... Well, one of the other... Tra- anyway, someone is so upset about the murders that he eventually nuclear blasts the entire area. But before all that, Hoyt does find Paul DeRay, and the solution that DeRay has found is that he has nailed himself to one of the Tesla trees. He's being electrocuted. He is in incredible pain, fatally, over and over again. And uh, this is... I. This is the first time I've made this connection, but like Prometheus, every day his flesh regrows and every day he is electrocuted to death. And his goal is that is to beco- destroy his body so bad that the cruciform is rejects him and he can die without being regrown. Uh, the Bakora show this to Father Hoyt. They take DeRay's cruciform and attach it to Hoyt. And also another one, just for good measure. Hoyt's got two of them. He's in incredible pain. Uh, he ends up getting rescued, but if he travels away from Hyperion, which he has been doing, he's in incredible pain all the time. He's shooting up super space painkillers all the time. If he encounters the Shrike and he's the seventh pilgrim who gets his wish, his wish is to die permanently his wishes for permadeath and to not be resurrected through the cruciform that's chapter one this has a lot to do with the old gods by which i mean prometheus and oh whoa oh my god excuse me prometheus and zeus and their pals you know It doesn't really at all, but it has to do with a guy named John Keats, a real guy, who wrote a poem called Hyperion, or maybe even the Hyperion Contos, which is what this whole series is called. Someone in this book writes, maybe not in this book, the Hyperion Cantos, about Pluto and the old gods. Anyway, the soldier's name is Fedman Kassad. His story is about a ghost in the machine. He's a military man. In the military, you do a lot of simulations. Old wars, the old land battles of old Earth. He's fighting in a jungle, slaying many men. There's bloodshed and carnage. This this story, my friend Thrash told me, it sounded like it reminded him of Spawn. And it is, it's, it's just, it is a comic book soldier story. He's shooting men, he's slicing them with his... Uh, you know, I don't know, a blade or something. There's blood and bodies all over the place. And then he sees on the battlefield, Moneta. Isn't there a song about love blooming on a battlefield or something? Fedman and Moneto, Mon- <laughs> Fedmont and Moneta exchange no words. They don't have to. They're overcome with the lust of battle and physicality. They throw themselves at each other and make filthy, filthy, messy sex (laughs) among the corpses. Fedmond is being trained as a soldier. Eventually, he is wounded in battle, a rebellion of some sort, but I'm not... I am going to listen to this again. I'm not entirely exactly sure. He ends up on a hospital ship, and he's been wounded. And for a man wounded, he does some super heroics. The hospital ship is attacked by the Ousters. The Ousters are a segment of humanity that left for space long before Old Earth, before the big mistake that destroyed Old Earth. World building. The Ousters have been away for so long that they have changed. 
it's just it's interesting that uh, the author makes sure to describe them as human, even as he does it. Like, is there's all it's always like cause it's always like you know, Kassad crushes the man's skull against the bulkhead and floats on towards his next, you know, kicks off towards his next adversary or whatever. Like, it definitely refers to them as human, but they also have they they uh they are described as having long and spindly limbs. They carry weapons and tools in all four of their appendages. Their feet are grabby like hands, and they are they always wear visors, big helmets. Their faces have never been seen. Maybe no one knows what they look like. That, you know, is classic. So this hospital ship was traveling uh, past Hyperion when the Ousters attack it. The Ousters are, they have an interest in Hyperion, and a lot of the plot of this book involves an attack against Hyperion. And uh, this is maybe one of the first ouster attacks. This is maybe how it began. Uh, on Hyperion. One of the first ouster attacks on Hyperion. Moneta is there and they speak for the first time. She says something along the lines of like... Well, she either says that she knows him from her past and his future. Or his future and her past that must be what it is if she knows him she must know him from her past maybe but it turns out that Moneta and time don't really have a working relationship the ousters attack and in a many pages long scene of what I can only describe as total a anime I almost said anarchy both anime anarchy explodes in a blast of timey-wimey bullshit. The Shrike is moving backwards for t through time. Time slows down. Fedmont is moving super fast through time, fighting the ousters, and uh, they're being destroyed and taken apart by the sh Taking apart backwards, I guess. I guess the Shrike's putting them back together. I don't know. Time has fucked off. Moneta's blasting... I'm picturing Moneta absolutely now as as like who's the spawn guy? Uh Seth McFarlane. Todd McFarlane woman with a, a giant plasma rifle and a lot of bulbous tubes and you know, she's blasting away. Uh Fedmont's slaying every everyone there's murders and he he sees a vision of the Shrike's terrible bloody tree and of all of the bodies of these ousters hanging upon it. And he knows that these, not just these ousters, other ousters, he knows that all of the ousters hanging upon this tree are ousters that the Shrike will kill in the future because the bodies are now traveling backward in time. Somewhere in Hyperion, the Shrike is hanging. The bodies writhe and scream because they are kept alive forever, traveling backwards in time on the Shrike's terrible tree of impaling. The Shrike is like Grendel, it's Dracula, it's fucking Shinji Ikari, the devil himself. It's probably that last one. I'm in the middle of the second book. We're going to go through this. I'm going to let you know what this shit is about, but I do have a feeling that there might be an instrumentality. I may not have mentioned that the reason we are told these stories, the, the reader, is because the pilgrims are telling each other these stories as they travel towards the time tombs, the destination of the Shrike pilgrimage. When he mentions that he had a vision of the Shrike's tree, the other pilgrims ask Fedban Kassad if he saw any of their bodies hanging there, and he says yes. Kassan and Moneta have some sex again. Uh, and this time, while they are engaged in the act, again amongst bodies and blood and body parts, lovers directly upon the battlefield, she begins changing shape. He doesn't know at the time, and now looking back on it, he does not know if he was hallucinating, he does not know if the time manipulation had was just collapsing and his mind couldn't handle it but she begins to transform into the shrike while they are making love this upsets him greatly uh she must she must fuck off she must like hop off and leave 
because he ev he leaves Hi he finds his way back to the city of Keats and finds his way off Hyperion. But now he's returning to find the truth about Moneta. And if uh, if Moneta was the Shrike the entire time, because now the Shrike is causing problems and is destroying whole cities. Hi, Prika. The real inciting incident is that the Shrike has been traveling outside of its domain and just decimating Hyperion. So he is going to return, find out the truth about Moneta, and uh, if she is the Shrike, he has brought a weapon that he believes will at least give him a chance to kill it. Martin Silenus is a poet. He was born on Old Earth. He's an interesting character. He's like 500 or 1,000 years old. Somewhere in between. There's some type of treatment humans can get. Newer, the, the newer technology doesn't leave you quite as blue as it originally did, but a great deal of the humans living on Old Earth were quite blue because of this treatment in it, and how the technology worked in its infancy. But he's been alive for a long time. <laughs> Old Earth was destroyed by something called the Big Mistake where a bunch of uh, scientists, and again, this is something that it's starting to explain more now that I'm in the second book, but uh, a bunch of dudes somehow caused a black hole to appear in the center of the planet. And, uh, well, instead of blinking everything out of existence, the planet slowly uh, came apart and became uninhabitable. And now it's... They talk about viewing the remains of Old Earth. They don't talk about if it's like an asteroid belt now or if there is a smoldering. Must not have been a very big black hole. Mars is still there. Martin Salinas was from a rich family. That's why he could afford to be so old. Uh, as, as Earth comes to an end, his mother, uh, you know, uses some of his fortune to send him to some colony. But... The suspended animation technology that they also use for suspending space travelers on long hyperspeed flights is also not quite there yet. So he comes out quite brain damaged and he cannot even speak at first. And it turns out that, well, I guess it wouldn't matter since he can barely speak. He does something, I think, that's basically the seven words you can't say on TV by George Carlin. He starts using only those words. But he's in a work colony. They put him to work because... He can't do anything else. He has a friend. I believe that there might be... I believe he might mention a friend called Unk, which might be a Sirens of Titan reference, but I might have made that up. That might not be in the book. I'm going to listen to this again. I'm going to keep... This is my current thing. I'm going to be talking about this. There's going to be a couple videos, probably in different formats, about this whole thing. He slowly regains his ability of thought by writing. And he writes his contos. I don't know if this is the Hyperion contos yet. At, at a certain point, he refers to something as his contos. And he also refers to the Hyperion contos, which is also a piece of writing he wrote. They may be the same piece of writing, although... I'm not sure because the Hyperion contos exists on Earth. It seems like he wrote the same Hyperion contos. James Keats... John Keats is all wrapped up in this? Let's move on for... But anyway... <laughs> his contos definitely... Probably? I should probably read Hyperion by John Keats. I've read part of it now. Really, that... that That's something I should do if I'm gonna be getting into this. Anyway... He finally leaves... He finally becomes sensate enough to realize that he's just in this work colony uh, and he can leave and he has this piece of writing that he thinks he can get published there's this character that uh, he meets that is like a another very old and this is still long ago this is still before the time of the current uh, Hyperion conflict he meets this social elite publisher who is going to edit his work and he of course wants to publish the contos uh, but she's like, obviously that won't sell. And she convinces him to write a novel, Tales of Old Earth. And it becomes a series, an ongoing series. And, uh, you know, he's writing, but he's not making art. And he's famous and cherished. And people love the characters of this book of 
these fantasy books he's writing, but he knows that the truth is in his contos, which he eventually publishes and no one reads. So he travels to Hyperion, not on the pilgrimage. He travels to Hyperion with Sad King Billy. Sad King Billy is great. I think there's a ween song about him. There's a great statue of Sad King Billy's face in profile carved into the side of some cliff on Hyperion. And uh, when you go to see it, it's disappointing because it doesn't really look like (laughs) Sad King Billy. And isn't that just appropriate? Sad King Billy has... I think Sad King Billy may have founded... He may have been one of the first colonists on Hyperion. He may have founded the human colonies on Hyperion. Sad King Billy's home is the City of Poets. He has collected artists and poets from throughout the galaxy to come here and live in outer space Walden on the edges of the hegemony and create true art. Martin Silenus' Cantos... He finds that his writing starts to be about the Shrike murdering people in the night. And Sad King Billy observes that often when he writes these things, many similar murders occur all over the City of Poets until the point when, and this again is long ago, the City of Poets was decimated long before the current Shrike decimation that's going on. The Shrike, Hyperion's a bad place. Sad King Billy figures out that there's some Martin Salinas by the end of this is well we'll get there I guess <laughs> Sad King Billy takes the cantos the, the manuscripts he's gonna throw them in the fire like in Little Women he's like you are writing about the thing and making these happen you have the timey wimey connection you're either you're you, but Billy doesn't think you know prob- Martin Salinas probably thinks he's receiving some kind of you know, vision, and he's just writing down what happened. Billy thinks that Martin is writing and making it happen. Very small, very small, little subtle, but important, important detail there. So Billy's burning the pages. Martin Salinas is very upset, and the Shrike is also upset because it shows up and and takes and stabs Sad King Billy a lot of time, a lot of times, takes him away and hangs him on the tree. Martin Salinas ends up not sure if the Shrike is his creation entirely. He almost feels that somehow he wrote the Shrike into existence. I'm not really sure what his motivations are of returning on the pilgrimage, but uh, he has written the Hyperion Cantos, and he feels that he has to bring it to Hyperion. Chapter 4 is just a tragedy. Saul Weintraub has a daughter named Rachel. Rachel is an archeologist. She's young, she's 30. She's got a boyfriend. She travels to Hyperion to visit the time tombs to do a little archeology. span The time tombs are closed. They're very famously closed. And also, the whole area is traveling backwards in time. I might have mentioned that. There's an anti-entropic field People aren't really sure why. That's one of the things they're studying. Uh, At some point, it is said that the time tombs will open. Obviously, that's because they were open in their future, which is their past. Our future, which is their past, before they were closed to us as they are now. But in our future, they will open again. And what will they contain? One night, Rachel is near one of the tombs, the Sphinx. Um, Something happens. I, um, I smoked that old joint. Rachel gets sick. She catches a disease at the anti-entropic time tombs. They're, they end, and they end up, it's funny they don't name the, di- they call it Merlin syndrome, like the wizard. Uh, she starts aging backwards. Also because, because she's aging backwards, her memories When she wakes up every morning, she only has the memories that she would have had leading up to that day in her original timeline. And that's really where the tragedy gets built in this story. She goes back to Earth to live with Saul and her mother. 
So Rachel goes back to Earth. Um, she kind of vaguely, at first, only kind of needs to get reminded of what's going on. The the at first, the big problem is her amnesia, and she just kind of has to be reminded first of all why she's she on Earth. She feels like she went to sleep. Well, at this point, it's you know whatever a week ago, two weeks ago, she went to sleep on Hyperion. Now she's waking up four weeks into the future on Earth. She has no percep- perception of the intervening time. She thinks she went to bed on that period and woke up on Earth. That's the that's the least of our problems. Uh, something I thought was really interesting is eventually she starts waking up every day and she has her journals and her records of everything that happened to her. Um, so every day she starts, she wakes up and reads about what happened to her and every day it's fresh for her. So every day she wakes up and relives that trauma and she starts coming downstairs and saying things like, I did, this is, that's a me that never existed. I didn't even make the decision to go to Hyperion. I didn't, I'm not even interested in archeology. span I didn't make any of the decisions that led to this timeline. And now I'm slowly disappearing. I won't even remember saying this today and tomorrow I'm going to say the same thing and it becomes all day. So how they solve the problem is they take away her records and her journals and now she's starting to become a child. And so every day she wakes up and she's like, ah, yes, I have a test in school today and they have to explain to her. You know, no, actually, you've been sick and a lot of time has passed. And it's getting to the point where she doesn't even quite understand. And uh, there there really are, there's several pages towards the end of the story that are really just about, wow, that are just about Saul kind of watching his daughter go away. Uh... (laughs) Uh, Saul with baby Rachel, who is now like two weeks old and aging in reverse and going to vanish, has joined the Shrike pilgrimage. Maybe because he hopes if he returns to the Sphinx, there will be some kind of an answer or something will come full circle. Time sure is fucked up for Saul and Rachel. There's also a John Keats poem called Lamia. Lamias are some kind of desert winged lion women. And also the name of a poem by John Keats. And in this story, a lady named Braun Lamia meets John Keats in the future. This story is about the Technocore. I I don't think I've even said the word Technocore yet. So... Maybe this will be the last time I'll say the word world. I, you know, this is it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to intentionally, from now on, when I feel it coming, I'm going to not say it, but world building. So the Technocore is, it's AI civilization. It's a group of AIs. It's a hive mind, but obviously there are factions within it. They are in, there are individuals within it. Uh, there are three main factions. Uh... There's a lot about religion in various churches in this book. You know, there's the Catholic planet, there's the Templar tree planet, and uh, there is talk about it. The, the Ultimates, which are the third faction of the Techno Core, they're not really described as the church or, or the robot religion or anything like that, but it is said that their idea, their path to godhood is this ultimate that they are seeking. The ultimate will be the true AI that is able to predict the future to 100% and also unpack unpack the past and record the past at 100% accuracy based on samples, you know, taken from our current time and algorithmically expanded. You know, once an AI is able to fully understand the true architecture and mathematics of the universe, that will be robot godhood. Uh, So one of the one of the parts of this project of unpacking the past is they are bringing back famous personalities based on their writings, based on, uh, you know, various crap and what they know about their life, but also based on reverse 
algorithmic, you know, the code that still exists in the universe to bring back John Keats's personality and put him into a robot body where he is murdered. To be honest, there's a whole murder mystery that goes on here. There's at least three different John Keatses. Four if you count the one that lived on Earth. I'm not too sure. The murder mystery has to do with the Technocore and the government trying to track, track down this John Keats personality. Someone kills one of his versions. Or, you know, one version of his personality imprint or whatever. He comes back maybe in a new body or maybe this is the first time he enters a body at all. We don't know where the Technocore is located. We don't know if it has servers. We don't know if it's just some vast cloud computing out there in the galaxy. But humanity does have contact with the cat Technocore. The Technocore has contact with the Ousters. Those are really the three main political parties at play. I'm not going to say it. Braun Lamia starts investigating John Keats's murder. And they decide he has to go to Hyperion, but he cannot leave the World Web. That might be what it is, yeah. An AI in a body cannot leave the world web. And they're called cybrids. AIs in human... He is in a fleshy human body. It's a new technology. He's a skin job. Uh, they're called cybrids. Because of this, they have to, like, extract his personality imprint and place it in a little bangle or something. And uh, they have to go through, you know, they have to go through... They have to find, you know, these underground... Uh, you know, hacker. This is the very cyberpunk. There's a lot of different worlds. This one, actually, we meet uh, the president of the Galactic Hege the Hegemony of Man, and I should say the CEO. It, the, the leader of mankind is a CEO. Her name is Gladstone, I believe. She's much more of a character in the second book, so we'll talk about her more. Uh, and she is, she is a, uh, a contact of Braun Lamia. She was a friend of Braun's father. Braun, Braun Lamia's, in her narration, she's always talking about how she gripped her father's old pistol tightly. She's very much a detective in the order. Her father killed himself because of some mystery that probably has something to do with all of this old earth unpacking the past John Keats stuff that's going on. Something goes wrong. They're attacked. The John, the cybrid is destroyed in the back of her mind as well. The personality kind of gets, I must, I think I was not really listening at this point. I, his personality is sort of imprinted onto her as well, but, it, but they also end up printing another cybrid of him, which is the, the fourth, the third or fourth one. And he ends up being the main character of the second book. And he talks to the, so he might be, they might have, they may, basically, they may have, they may have captured the imprint and he ends up working with the hegemony. That might be what happened, but I'm confused about exactly what happens. But she travels back to Hyperion. Uh, John Keats has, might have something to do with this whole Shrike thing. You know, the, the Shrike, I get, I think it gets more into the second, in the second book gets more into it. Maybe not. It might be towards the end of the first book. We talk about how they believe that it is a weapon or something that was sent. Well, obviously it was probably. Almost obviously it was sent from the future because it is traveling back in time and causing all of these problems as it goes back in time. So it was created, maybe. Maybe it was created for a reason and so were the time tombs and they're going back in time because of something that's going to happen on Hyperion. Everyone's very interested in Hyperion. I sh I'm going to listen to the first book again and I should really, really listen to Braun Lamia's story because it, it might be the most important story as far as the whole thing there's a character named the console. He's like a government agent. We don't, I don't think we even learn his first name. The sixth story is not told from his perspective, but I don't think we know that at first. And it's a little weird because we're not sure if the character we're talking about, the character is not the character that the sixth, the sixth story is about is the console's grandfather who was a soldier of the hegemony and this is a story about how, about his wife mainly and how he kind of loses his wife during the early days of space travel where he was traveling to be in be a soldier and be in these battles and go off to war every time he would go off because of this time debt that early space travel travel inflicted and i think 
just from the kind of context of what the world is like, you can kind of tell that this happened long ago when they're telling the story. It's on a planet where humans came to colonize and also talking dolphins. Maybe the dolphins learned to talk or maybe humans learned to talk to them. But it's one of those. This was almost like a thing in the 90s that like it's not like we le- it's not like it's almost like we always could have talked to dolphins. There's just talking dolphins now because we just figured out how to, they just now they bothered to talk to us or something. I think I'm just thinking about that guy that wants room service. Johnny Mnemonic. But it's a little weird and I'll 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 definitely end up talking about more. One of course there's got to be one weird kind of weird thing. Well, there's a couple things that were off-putting about this book. I'll talk about this more. It's weird that every time he returns from his from losing 10 years of his life, not his life, he's still a young man. He's like 19 through 25 most of this story, but he keeps coming back to an older wife and she wasn't even and when he first meets her she's not even his wife what's weird is that he meets her when she's 15 so every time he comes back there's a passage about ah she no longer had that young 15 year old body i don't know i'll talk about it more but the story mainly concerns how he keeps returning and what goes on in her life they have children that uh, are born and die while he's gone that he doesn't even get to meet. All of these things about how her life is just passing by in the blink of an eye in front of him. The whole time that he's telling the story, he's also talking about how he's making this long walk, maybe across a desert or a plain towards her tomb. She has now lived her entire life while he has been going back and forth. And this story turns out, and I guess full spoilers. I mean, this is it. I mean, this is the end. Absolutely, this entire thing, if you're watching this, why why are you watching this? This has been absolutely full spoilers. So this last chapter has a lot to do with the Austers. It has a lot to do with... Uh, his wife might have had something to do with how the Austers originally left the hegemony. Um, she has something to do... I believe she has something to do with the rebellion where Kassad was injured that led to... The beginning of some of this but uh but maybe not i i haven't i wasn't paying a lot of attention to the actual war uh stories going on he and his wife have a lot to do either with a rebellion against the hedge the hegemony maybe even the original ouster rebellion but uh the consul's grandfather had something to do with the ousters and the consul eventually uh is a government agent who has who is a spy he's betrayed the hegemony he has been living with the ousters he came back to accept this assignment under false pretenses, under undercovery, double agent kind of pretenses. The ousters have done, in his opinion, what humanity was unable to do, what led to the end of old earth. They have grown and changed. He talks about their holidays. He talks about traveling on their swarm ships and meeting up with them for, you know, the week long meet and greets or whatever and how they, they've They've grown and their society, you know, is able to exist within the cosmos and not fuck around with anyone else. Apparently, they have a problem with Hyperion, but he's, you know, he's into their lifestyle and they've given him an item, an item that will cancel out the anti-antropic fields. So basically, it will force the time tombs back into the regular flow of time, whether or not that causes them to open or cause this day of prophecy or whether or not still even in our minds well all of these characters have seen the shrike so the shrike yeah he knows the shrike exists actually the console may not have seen the shrike this might be the console's first time on hyperion he might be the one well also saul but rachel has been to hyperion so so he sets off this device the anti-entropic fields are gone. Time is going to flow normally. The Shrike is ostensibly freed, although what was holding it back was not much anymore. They're traveling down the... At this point, they're on foot, walking down... Oh, Het Mastine, the reason there's no seventh story is that the Templar disappears on one of the final mornings. His room is covered in blood, but there's no body. Someone may have, One of the pilgrims may have killed him, we don't know. 
The Templar's gone. They're traveling down the road towards the end of their pilgrimage. One of them starts singing, We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. And uh, kind of like that TV show about the Italian.